Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison, your host for today. Now, if you've been following these shows, brilliant. But if you're new to Nature Live, these events are a chance for you to meet and speak with some of the scientists that work behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London to find out a bit more about our collections and about the brilliant research that goes on at the museum. And for today's talk, we're going to be finding out about a fantastic new project aimed at creating vital new habitat for important invertebrates like butterflies. And I'm really excited to be joined by two of our brilliant scientists, Katie and Steph. Now, as always with our Nature Live shows, if you have any questions for any of our scientists, please do post those in the chat. We love to hear from you, our viewers. So don't be shy, pop any questions in the chat. We'll get through as many of yours as we can in the time that we have. And if you're enjoying the show, do consider leaving us a small donation. The museum is a charity and with our doors closed at the moment, we are losing vital income. So if you're happy to, if you're able to spare just a small donation, no matter how the size, we would very much appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, the donation button is just above the chat. If you're watching us on our website, it's in the top right hand corner of the page. But let me introduce you to our speakers for today. They both work at the Natural History Museum. But first up, we have Katie. Hi. <laughs> and also joining us today is Steph. Are you there, Steph? Hey. Brilliant. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to find out about this project. But let's um, start off by finding out, first of all, what you do at the museum. So, Steph, if we start with you. Yeah, so I'm an ecologist and I work in the Angela Marmont Centre for UK Biodiversity as UK Biodiversity Training Manager. So as well as developing new training tools and, and courses and things like that for the museum, I also work across a number of our UK biodiversity projects, including Brilliant Butterflies, which is a project we've been working on in partnership with the London Wildlife Trust and Butterfly Conservation. Um, and Katie? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Katie Potts. I'm an entomologist, which means I study insects and I'm fascinated by all insects. <laughs> um, I'm the project officer on the Brilliant Butterflies project here um, at the NHM and my role on the project revolves around taking eDNA surveys um, on the nature reserves and teaching people all about sort of the fascinating invertebrates we find on our chalk grassland sites um, and teaching them, like I say, through a training programme called Grasslands Heroes, which we'll be talking about later on. I've had my eye on this project for a while and I'm very excited to find out about it. So so tell us exactly what is uh, Brilliant Butterflies? What is the project all about? Yeah, so the, the project is a partnership, um, like Steph said, with London Wildlife Trust, the Natural History Museum and, Bril and Butterfly Conservation. And it's a really generously funded by a Dream Fund Award with thanks to all the players of the People's Postcode Lottery. Um, and on the project, we're working with local people in Croydon and Bromley to restore a really rare habitat that's called chalk grassland. Um, and the whole team have been really busy over the past year and a half working on the nature reserves with the local community. So the London Wildlife Trust Social Butterflies team have done an amazing job working with local community communities, sorry, um, running events, walks and talks. Um, the butterfly conservation team have been really busy working hard to restore and sort of create new butterfly banks, um, sort of like along sort of road verges in schools. Um, the London Wildlife Trust team as well have been like restoring the actual chalk grass and habitats on the sites as well. So the whole team's been very busy and here at the NHM we've been undertaking eDNA surveys um, to better understand the invertebrate, invertebrates present on the sites and we're also delivering this invertebrate identification course I mentioned, the Grass and Heroes, um, to the locals from Croydon and Bromley. Um, but we've got a little bit of an introduction video from one of our colleagues, Anna, from London Wildlife Trust, and she'll tell you a little bit more about the, the project as a whole. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm the Nature Reserves Officer on the Brilliant Butterflies Project. It's a partnership project between London Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation and the Natural History Museum, supported by players of the People's Postcode Lottery. I'm here today on one of the six chalk grassland nature reserves where I spend a lot of time working with groups of local volunteers to restore these valuable habitats. Just one square metre of chalk grassland can have up to 40 different species, so every metre really does count. 
As well as restoring the chalk grassland, we're also creating new habitats, engaging with local people and leading on groundbreaking scientific research. My fantastic colleagues at the Natural History Museum are working on pioneering environmental or eDNA technology. They're going to tell you a bit more about that in a minute. We've also been working alongside butterfly conservation across Croydon and Bromley, right in the heart of urban communities, to build butterfly banks. These mini chalky habitat islands help to develop a living landscape and provide the perfect place for butterflies and other insects to thrive and be enjoyed by everyone. What an awesome project. And I, I have to say, as a South Londoner, I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I, I wasn't aware we have these amazing habitats on our doorstep. So, so what exactly is, is uh, chalk grassland and, and ha what sorts of plants and animals would we find there? Yeah, so chalk grassland is a habitat that's only really found in northwest Europe. And a large proportion of that is actually in England. So um, it used to be really, really widespread. Um, but following the Second World War and a massive sort of in intensification around agriculture, the chalk grasses have declined. And it's estimated that they declined around 80 percent, which is a huge reduction. Um, but they're characterized by sort of being lime rich, but nutrient poor sort of habitats. And they've got very thin soils that struggle to hold moisture. Um, so the chalk grasses are found often over limestone and chalk rocks, mainly in the warmer, drier, sort of southern eastern areas of the UK. Um, and although this might not sound like a particularly productive habitat, the more sort of challenging conditions mean that plant species like dominant grasses, which would usually sort of overrun and outcompete other species of plants, they find it hard to take hold in these chalk grass and habitats. So it means that the other flowering part plants are able to persist and bloom. Plants like various species of orchids are great examples of this. Um, and yeah, the chalk grass and so, so support a real sort of variety of rare plants and animals. And many of them have got really intri intricate unique relationships with each other and they can't survive in other habitats so species like um, may lay their eggs on certain species of grass as a wildflower like chalk hill blue butterflies and adonis blue butterflies um, only feed on horseshoe vetch which is found on chalk grasslands lots of solitary bees and wasps use the bare chalk to create little burrows and lay their eggs inside of so it really can be this like little final frontier for so many species to live on on these chalk grasslands and um, yeah in the next like, series of photos we can see some nice um, pictures of yeah I think we're Oh, yeah, we've got some. Oh, yeah, got some lovely images. Yeah, sorry, we've got um, and lovely images here. So we've got um, the you can see in the bottom left there, we've got the the wasp spider, which is an incredible spider. If you live or local to Biggin Hill or down, you can see them in the summer along the chalk grassland that's just along the side of West Kent Golf Course. And it's just a, an amazing spider. They're humongous. They can grow up to around seven millimetres in length, so just under two centimetres. And they create these really cool little zigzag patterns in their webs. So if you can't spot the yellow spiders in the grasses, you can often see these zigzag patterns in the webs, whether they're there or not, or hiding in the grasses. Um, we've got the picture of the snail there as well. That's the um, the Roman snail. And we, we find that snail really commonly on Chapel Bank site, but it's not a common species of snail. It's very rare and it's actually protected. So that's a really nice species we've got there. And then in the top left hand corner there, this is the wartbiter bush cricket. Now, this isn't present on any of our project sites, but it's a really fantastic chalk grass and invertebrate. And the adults lay their eggs in the bare soil, sort of close to the sort of clumps of grasses. And the eggs are made dormant there for around two years. And then they sort of hatch around mid spring. And then they have several little nymph stages, which are just mini versions of the, the adult sort of bug or the, um, the adult cricket, sorry. Um, yeah, and then they'll sort of develop and grow and then the adult stages will emerge and they sort of need the sort of longer tussocks of grasses so this particular species needs a real a range in terms of its habitat conditions throughout its whole life cycle so the chalk grassland can provide this sort of mosaic of habitat for them and the walk by to bush cricket um, historically used to be incredibly widespread in southern england 
but now it's very, very rare. It's in, considered to be one of the most endangered insects and can be found on around four or five sites. And it just sort of highlights the, the plight of many of these chalk grass and invertebrates and the struggles that they face. So it's just a nice little one to talk about there. Absolutely. And and as well as maintaining the, these chalk grassland habitats, we're, we're also creating new habitats, aren't we, like butterfly banks and, and connective corridors. How do they work? So essentially, these butterfly banks we've been creating are stepping stones of habitat. They're mini nature reserves almost that can be used to connect up the nature reserve sites that Katie's just been talking about. And from my perspective, the first time I went out to see some of these sites, I was absolutely amazed by the quality of the nature reserves. But of course, they're surrounded by quite urban areas, which makes it really quite difficult for wildlife to cross through them. By by trialing different ways of creating these butterfly banks, and you can see some of our volunteers um, building uh, one of them uh, there. We've been using various different techniques to try to do this. Um, but by doing this, we can create these little pocket habitats from low nutrient chalk based soil like you can see here this one's just been created from bare chalk to see what what will grow on from that um, we can create these little pockets of invertebrate habitat the invertebrates can then use those as stepping stones to get between these amazing nature reserve sites and it enables butterflies other invertebrates many species to travel through our urban areas Essentially, they make our urban spaces much more permeable and much more habitable to wildlife. So as well as invertebrates, they create opportunities for native wildflowers and grasses to thrive as well. And they'll bring in other species like bats and birds, which will feed on the invertebrates too. They're a very simple thing to create in reality, but they have huge potential to bring nature right into the heart of our towns and cities. And which is which is good for us and and good for for wildlife. We've actually had a really pertinent question come in actually from you, Lucy, asking: Is there a way to help volunteer to build the butterfly banks after restrictions ease? Of course, we saw some some volunteers in an earlier photo. How important are, are the volunteers, the local community, and and how can they get involved? Well, yeah, the working with the local. <laughs> Commu sorry, <laughs> jumping in. <laughs> Working with the local communities and volunteers is just so important as we're able to connect the local people with the wildlife that's around them. And at the end of the day, people protect what they know and love. And by connecting local communities to these like really special chalk grasslands, teaching them all about the invertebrates that live in them is just a fundamental part of the project. project. And it's, it's integral to the ongoing conservation of the chalk grass and sites and all of the invertebrates and the help that we've had from the volunteers and all the effort they've put in has just been outstanding they've worked so hard to to help with the habitat management of the sites to help them restore the chalk grasslands into this sort of prime perfect condition for the invertebrates to flourish going on in the future and yeah we're really excited to have the volunteers help join us on the grass and heroes course and the big bug hunts that we're going to be running in the summer and if you're particularly from Croydon and Bromley do join us at 5 p.m for our live Q&A session you can find the link on the the Nature Live website page um, to join us for that. Yep so so Lucy uh, if you're local if you're local to that area do join in do check out that that link. Um, so Steph let's talk about the the museum specific involvement with the project because we're, we're surveying is that right? Yeah so I mean the whole project is done as a partnership with London Wildlife Trust and Butterfly Conservation very much a joint effort but our side of the project is in effect looking at all of the invertebrates that aren't butterflies despite the title <laughs> we're, we're mostly leaving a lot of the survey work around that to butterfly conservation and um, and they've been doing some fantastic work on that but there's a few things that we are doing specifically on the other invertebrates we're undertaking a program of traditional invertebrate surveys um, and then we're also as Katie's already mentioned we're training local volunteers in species identification so they can help us out with that and also continue to record um, what's going on with these sites after the project is finished as well but most importantly for us we're trying new ways of surveying and identifying invertebrates in a really rapid form using environmental DNA eDNA and DNA extraction from samples from traditional invertebrate trapping methods as well. So these are much faster ways of getting identifications. 
We've, we've been pioneering um, this technique at the museum, um, using the experience of our laboratories and our entomologists across the museum, as well as working with the volunteers. And Brilliant Butterflies has been a particularly important component in doing this. It also connects really well with other projects that we're working on in the museum. Things that you might have heard of, like the Urban Nature Project and the Darwin Tree of Life Project, we're working really closely with those as well to make sure that we you know, really can advance some of the science behind uh, these new techniques. Absolutely. And it's interesting, we had a, a question come in earlier from Claudia asking what an eDNA survey is, an environmental DNA survey. Uh, so, uh, Claudia, watch this space. We, we are going to uh, talk about, about that in a bit more detail. Uh, but Katie, talk us through some of the, the surveying techniques that you, you actually use at these sites. How do you go about surveying? Yeah, yeah. So in order to understand what sort of invertebrates we have on the sites, we need to be able to survey them properly. So we usually take a whole series of surveys, um, traditionally using things like butterfly nets to survey the grasslands, for example, is a common method. So <laughs> we would do this by running <laughs> running a butterfly net or a sweep net transect, which um, we'd basically walk down a designated line through the grassland and we'd collect all of the invertebrates that we see within a set distance from that line within the net. We can also set up a whole suite of other sort of trapping methods as well, which are great. So um, yellow pan traps um, are fantastic. They're little yellow bowls and they attract lots of pollinators that are typically attracted, attracted to yellow flowers. So the yellow bowls act like these giant big yellow flowers to a, to a pollinator. Um, we can also set up things like malaise traps, which are big tent-like structures that collect flying invertebrates. Um, and you can see stuff setting. It's, yeah, you're taking taking one down here um but they're yeah they're essentially we set them up on the flight paths and then the invertebrates fly into the tent up into a, a collection pot um, and then we can collect the samples that way another method is that we can set things like pitfall traps which are small collection pots that we place into the ground at, at the level with the soil and that collects all the ground dwelling vertebrates so the traditional sort of survey techniques usually consist of several methods combined together to make a whole picture of the different groups of invertebrates living within that habitat. And on this project, we're taking eDNA samples from the soil and we're setting up malaise and pitfall traps to sequence DNA from the specimens which have been caught in the traps. And we'll talk about a little bit more about the eDNA work shortly. So we've got uh, just a, an example there um, of, of what, what you can produce from a, a, a malaise trap. It looks like insect soup. So, so once you once you have your your samples, your specimens, how do you then go about identifying, working out what it is you've actually got? Yeah. So once we've got our specimens from the field, we'd bring them back to the museum and begin begin the process of identifying them under the microscope. And this can be simple, or it can be incredibly difficult. Um, but it can be helpful to begin the process by sorting the samples into their broad groupings. Um, and we do this by using identification guides and things called keys, which are basically just like a book with a whole series of questions in that will ask you questions about the, the insect's morphology and its body and the way it looks. And it will hopefully lead you to the correct type of um, insect or invertebrate that you have. It doesn't always happen that way. It can be very challenging. Um, like, yeah, it can be a difficult process. Um, and if you've never looked at invertebrates before, they vary so much in their morphological form. It can take years of study to get to grips with identifying them. Um, but one exciting thing is that we've been working on during this project is an identification guide to the main sort of broad group groupings of invertebrates that are commonly found on sites like chalk grasslands. And we're going to have a really quick look now um, while we look at some specimens down the microscope and look at the little ID guide to see just basically a process of how we might identify them. So we've got a picture here. We've got two insects here. We've got on the left, we've got a bee. And then on the right, we've got a fly. And the, the fly on the right is called a bee fly. And they're just, just so deceitful, little creatures mimicking bees fantastic predator avoidance sort of mechanism, but they're just the cutest flies ever. But how would we begin about I'm trying to separate these? They both kind of, you know, it would be common to look at the, the one on the right hand side and think it's a bee. 
But if we look at the differences between the wings, this is a really key way in which we can tell apart these two groups. So if we look here, we've got the flies. If you can see on the cartoon there, it's sort of got the coloured wings in blue. And we can see that there's two wings there, or one pair. And this is a really key character for the flies. And let me just get up a specimen here. And just while you're doing that, um, Katie, we've got mm. we've had a, a couple of uh, uh, questions. People asking uh, about the the specimens that the samples that you collect are, are are they killed? That's that's necessary for the for the the study. Is that correct? I'll let you answer that one, Steph. If that's right. Well, yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So for some of the samples that we need to take for this project, um, like the malaise traps and the pitfall traps, particularly, the samples are um, collected in hundred percent ethanol. Um, there's a few different reasons for that um, and partly it's to do with um, the fact that we need to extract the DNA from the sample. One of the advantages that we get with things like eDNA samples increasingly as we get better and better at survey techniques using that is that because we're sampling from the environment we don't need to take as many specimens um, as we're doing it. So for example the soil samples uh, that we take we're not actually doing directly taking the insects themselves. We're sampling um, their DNA from where they've moved through the soil. So going forward, hopefully part of what we're developing here will allow us to do these types of surveys without taking so many samples from the wild. Now, obviously, some of these surveys do require us to take invertebrates and do require us to kill invertebrates. And that is something that we consider very, very carefully whenever we're doing this. This isn't something we're doing without, without any thought. Um, and ethical considerations within entomological samples, really important thing to consider. The amount that we're taking is very, very small compared to the populations of what we're looking at. It's a very, very small sample size, which isn't going to have impacts on populations. We don't do these surveys frequently. We, in fact, only do them for two. When, in fact, last year, obviously, because of restrictions of COVID, we only actually did this survey once. So they're very short windows of time. They give us a snapshot of what's going on and not and so they're not out there constantly. In addition, those samples are used in multiple different ways as well. So it's mm -hmm. not that we're taking the samples and they're not being you know, used once and then thrown away. The samples will go into our collections. They get used yeah. for multiple different surveys. So it's a very efficient way of, of dealing with it because we're not simply using the specimens once and never again. Um, so it's something we do take very seriously. Um, it is necessary for some surveys and certainly some of the specimens, for example, with identification would need to be dissected. And of course you can't do um, some of these, some of these uh, identifications on live specimens. Where we can, we do, um, and we very much prefer to, to do that. But for some samples, we do still need to do that. Sure. And that's really, really good to know. Um, I think Katie is, is ready with the, the microscope. So I think we can have a, a quick look at a specimen. Wow, look at this. Yeah, so I was just trying to highlight that you can see there that it's got two wings, whereas mm -hmm. our, our bee on the other picture we had a moment ago has four. Let me just whiz this one away real quick. I'm going to show you a little crane fly under here, which he's absolutely massive, or it's massive. Um, so I apologise. Wow. Just, but what we're trying to look at here, so the other fly also has these structures, but it's a bit too tricky to see on the specimen under the microscope. So we're looking at these features here. So I don't want to touch them. So these are called halters, these little like rod-like structures here sticking out and they're just underneath the wings. And they're like little gyroscopes essentially that help the, the flies to fly really efficiently, turn really quickly. And they're a really key character for the flies. And then if we just shoot back to the presentation. Yep, and we pop onto the slide with the Hymenoptera, which is our bees, wasps, and ants. 
that's it. Okay. So if you see on that little cartoon on the right hand side there, we've got the wings in the blue again, and they've got these, you can see that there's four wings there or two pairs of wings in the wasps and the bees there. Um, so that's our little quick and easy separation there. There's a whole bunch of other features, but not that we'll be able to show down the microscope with the specimens today. But this guide has just come out today, hot off the press. <laughs> so I think that should be in the description link box on the YouTube um, page if you want to see it. But also we're just going to have a look next as well on the next slide is our beetles. Now these I'm slightly biased, these are my favourite <laughs> insects. But our sort of key characters to begin identifying the beetles are that they have these hardened wing cases. So you can see that on the cartoon on the right hand side, the blue sort of area highlighted is showing those wing cases. So you should see the line going down the middle of the beetle's back with a little triangle at the top, that's called a scutellum. And these elytra are the key characters really. And then if you see at the top of the beetle's head, it's got the sort of mouth parts are highlighted in orange or red. And they're, they're like biting mandibles in the beetles, which is a really, really key character. And you can see that in the picture of the, the black beetle on the side there. But I'm just gonna show you a tiger beetle let's get this in focus and if anybody's ever seen a tiger beetle wow. out in the wild you'll know not to to be you'll know to be very careful with their their mandible <laughs> but let me just try and get those in a better viewing point for you so they've wow, got incredible fantastic mandibles and that's a really key character for our beetles there yeah. And then let me just beautiful. try and show you the wing cases. This specimen is quite large, so we won't be able to see it as a whole, but you can just see there. So the wing cases have slightly opened, and underneath you can see the membranous wings hiding in the back there. But these hardened wing cases on the outside are the real key character for the beetles alongside these biting mandibles. And one of the absolutely people, amazing they're incredible aren't they that's brilliant katie thank you so much for showing us that that's that's all we've got time for i'm afraid because I'm, I'm anxious to get on to talk a bit more about the the edna surveys and, and just before we do i, I want to give a shout out to uh, flame heart rose for for giving us a donation which is absolutely fantastic we we appreciate that very very much and thank you for that but we, we've mentioned already the, that we are conducting environmental DNA surveys. So, so how do they work and what's the big advantage? We've, I think we've, we've touched on a couple of them already, but what's the big advantage of, of taking eDNA? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a, one of the, a really exciting way around some of these challenges that we face with these traditional surveys um, and, and the identification as well. So it's a type of survey called environmental DNA and it's a method whereby which we search for DNA in an environment, so environmental DNA. And it tells us what sort of biological organisms have been present within the environment. So it can be helpful for landowners like wildlife trusts or, you know, uh, you know, even people that have nature reserves, you know, private land, anybody like that that wants to survey their land and yeah so we search for um sorry we can take the edna samples from water we can take them from air we can take them from snow and in the brilliant butterflies project we're taking our edna samples from the soil so for example an invertebrate like an earthworm or a beetle might move through the soil and as it does it leaves behind um, cells from its body or feces or mucus and then we when we undertake our eDNA surveys from the soil taking soil samples we can detect this DNA in the sample and after we've collected the soil samples we then sort of take them frozen <laughs> back into the museum laboratories we can take little freezer boxes or um, things like that into the field with us and when they're back into the museum molecular lab laboratories at the museum they're then prepared for dna extraction and sequencing and um, we sequence the dna by identifying molecular barcodes which are just very small fragments of the dna from the organism and we identify these barcodes we compare them to a database of dna barcodes and if we have that sequence for that species we should be then able to get a match 
and we can determine which species we have on the sites. And alongside the eDNA surveys that we're doing, we're also taking DNA samples from malaise and pitfall traps to sequence the DNA from the specimens which have been caught in the traps as well. So we're doing an awful lot of work. <laughs> an awful lot of work. It's fantastic. And you've managed to do some, some collecting already, haven't you, Steph? How, how is that going? Have we done any analysis on, on the surveys yet? So we've managed to get some um, collection in, uh, despite the restrictions last year, uh, we were able to get out on site. And as you've seen from some of the photographs, we've been able to get some of the some of the survey work done. And we're planning to do more this summer as well. The great thing is that we're finding when we've brought all of this back to the lab is that the processes we have got them to work. It's taken a little bit of trial and error with some of them because we're using a few different techniques. We're using eDNA from the soil samples um, and then we're also doing um, DNA extraction from the alcohol from the more traditional survey techniques as well. And we are fi finding that we're able to extract DNA from all of that. Uh, but what we get out at the other end isn't at this stage a speed species list. And that's what we're working towards. But at the moment, we get what we call operational taxonomic units, which trips off the tongue, of course. <laughs> these are <laughs> these are the readings from the DNA barcodes that Katie mentioned, and they are fundamentally different from each other. So they are in effect species, but we haven't necessarily got all the names next to them. Alongside all this sample analysis, and the reason a lot of this work is spread across different projects as well, is that we need to constantly develop a DNA barcode library, something where we can reference these operational taxonomic units back to, to pull out these species names, so we can understand what these OTUs actually mean, and therefore get out the species list. Now, I've been working on this for a while. It's still it's still in the process of developing, but it's definitely getting there. We're having to work closely with people like bioinformaticians, taxonomists across the museum to develop these processes further as the, as the project continues. But we're getting some really great and really exciting results out. Um, I'm really excited about where we, where we get to this year. Brilliant. Uh, we've had a, a question come from Sophie about the eDNA from the soil, asking, how do you know that the animal or plant was there recently and not a long time ago? Can we tell? It really depends a little bit on the, the species. Some types of DNA, some, some species DNA seems to hold a little bit longer than others. It's more a case of it identifying that there's presence there. Um, mm. so Again, that's that's part of what we're developing is actually understanding how long this stays present and particularly for different samples. So, for example, a water taking a sample from a water course, the water is constantly moving as well in a way that the soil being more static isn't likely to. Um, so it's more that it references the presence rather than it was there yesterday versus it was mm -hmm. there two years ago. A really great question from uh, from Sophie, and uh, just another thank you to Nigel who has, has given us a, a donation as well. So, so uh, very much grateful for that, Nigel. Thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, we are almost out of time. There's never enough time, but but let's talk about how the the public can get involved in this, this project because they absolutely can, can't they? Yeah. Yep, they can. So we've been, like I say, we've been developing this identification course called the Grass and Heroes, which is sort of identification training to the main groups of invertebrates that you can find on these chalk grass and sites. So we'll be looking at groups like we did with the beetles and the flies and the bees and learning how to separate them broadly. And then we'll have a little look at some chalk grassland specialists looking at what, you know, the key sort of chalk grassland indicators we might find on the sites. So, yeah, it's about giving the volunteers a broader understanding of the different groups of inverts that they might make, might find. Um, it will be part online, part in person, um, on one of the nature reserves in Croydon. So we'll have a little field lab station where we'll have microscopes and specimens and we'll do um, some of the training there. Um, if you enjoyed that little sort of very brief ID session we did then, then, yeah, and you're local to Croydon and Bromley, we really encourage you to get in touch. The Grass and Heroes course will be on the 25th to 26th and the 27th of May. Um, and then we'll do, be doing the big bug hunts where we show people how we do these eDNA surveys and some traditional survey techniques as well on the 8th and the 9th of June. Um, and we're going to be doing a Q&A at 5pm today for particularly from the people from Croydon and Brom Bromley. 
Um, if you're interested in finding more about the Grassland Heroes and the Big Bug Hunts and any other questions you have around those, really, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. There's also plenty of other ways as well, isn't there? So if people, for example, want to get involved in the butterfly bank creation, that sort of thing, if they go onto the London Wildlife Trust website, there's a newsletter that you can sign up to on there as well, um, with loads of other ways that you can get involved in the project aside from, from our bits too. Yeah. Brilliant. And if you don't live local to, to Croydon and, and Bromley in South London, we've had a couple of people like Shania was asking what plants, uh, what can she plant to attract butterflies? And George was uh, was interested in and how people in their own homes can help conserve yeah. insects. So uh, any top tips to, to finish off with? Well, I think I've got three things um, that I'd like anybody um, to, to think about doing. And the first one is to simply plant native wildflowers. If you haven't got a garden or if you've got a, if you can put in a window box or a pot on the patio, any native wildflowers that you can plant in there is a great way to encourage insects. Look for native wildflower species mixes. Things like cornfield annuals are great because they will bloom in the first year. You'll get an almost instant res uh, result and you'll be able to start getting insects coming in and supporting them from quite a, quite a distance around as well, which, is, which can always be really good fun. And particularly if you've got kids, that's great fun to do with kids and to actually watch all the pollinators coming in and what they're doing. You could even, if you've got the space in your own garden, of course, create your own mini butterfly bank, turn over some of the soil so that you get down into the topsoil, turn that over and seed into that because that will take out the nutrients from that topsoil layer. Second thing to do is to start recording wildlife. Learn how to learning how to identify wildlife is brilliant fun. It certainly kept me and Katie amused and lots and lots of our colleagues for our entire lives. Um, it's really good fun to do, but it's also really useful to science. You can contribute your records through apps and websites like iRecord and iNaturalist. And that means that your records add to our understanding of British wildlife and how it's changing. But if that's a bit nerve wracking, you can take part in citizen science projects, a local bioblitz, or go on a walk with your local wildlife trust. I can definitely recommend London Wildlife Trust, of course. Um, but there are always plenty of people around who can help and support you. Um, our identification and advisory service for the museum has a Facebook group specifically there to help you with identification. So you can send us photographs of things that you found and loads of people are now um, starting to send in um, their ID photographs. And it's a great place to learn and to chat about what it is that you're seeing too. Um, my third suggestion is to encourage your local community to create space for nature. You might be, you might have a local community garden near you or your school or church or another community facility might have a space that they could manage to encourage invertebrates as well. You could also speak to people who manage your local park as well. If more of our community spaces could find a home for a butterfly bank of their own, no matter where in the country they are, we could create these amazing stepping stones for nature right through our cities, towns and villages and really just dramatically change for the opportunities for wildlife within them um so uh, yeah go out and make some friends in your local community and see if there's definitely anything. definitely we are sadly very much out of time i'm afraid thank you both so much for this whistle top stop tour through brilliant butterflies an amazing project um, we'll have you back on definitely in the future once we've got some more results and we, we can find out a bit more about how those surveys are going but uh, thank you again we'll have to say goodbye to you both for now we'll see you again soon <laughs> Bye. Bye. And thank you to you, our viewers, for joining in today for all of your brilliant questions and for your donations as well. Very much appreciated. Apologies if we didn't get to all of your questions. There's never enough time, unfortunately. But Nature Live Online will be back next week. Next Tuesday, we'll be chatting with wildlife photographer Amy Vitali about her amazing work at photographing conservation projects around the world. So don't miss that one. Do catch up on our Nature Live Online on our YouTube as well. But we'll say goodbye to, for now and we hope to see you next time.